when my daughter Mary was just a small child. She was asked to perform a talent for a PTA contest. And this is her experience, exactly as she wrote it in her seven-year-old script. I was practicing the piano one day, and it made me cry because it was so bad. Then I decided to practice ballet, and it made me cry more. It was bad, too. So then I decided to draw a picture, because I knew I could do that good. But it was horrid, and of course it made me cry. Then my little three-year-old brother came up, and I said, Duffy, what can I be? What can I be? I can't be a piano player, or an artist, or a ballet girl. What can I be? He came up to me and whispered, you can be my sister. In an important moment, those five simple words changed the perspective and comforted the heart of a very anxious child. Life became better right on the spot, and as t always, tomorrow was a brighter day. All of us face those questions about our role, our purpose, our course in life, and we face them long after we are children. I visit with enough of you, and I remember our own university years well enough to know that many of you, perhaps most of you, have occasions when you feel off balance or defeated, at least temporarily. And we ask, what will I be? When will I graduate? Whom will I marry? What is my future? How will I make a living? Can I make a contribution? In short, what can I be? Take heart if you are still asking yourself such questions, because we all do. I do. We should concern ourselves with our fundamental purposes in life. Surely every philosopher, past and present, agrees that, is, that important as they are, food and shelter are not enough. We always want to know what's next. Where is the meaning? What is my purpose? When asking these questions, I found it extremely reassuring to remember that one of the most important and fundamental truths taught in the scriptures and in the temple is that every living thing shall fill the measure of its creation. I must admit that when I first heard this directive, I thought it meant only procreation, having issue, bearing offspring. And I'm sure that is probably the most important part of its meaning. But much of the temple ceremony is symbolic. So surely there can be multiple meanings in this statement as well. Part of the additional meaning I now see in that commandment is that every element of creation has its own purpose and performance. Every one of us has been designed with a divine role and mission in mind. I believe that if our desires and works are directed towards what our heavenly parents have intended us to be, we will come to feel our part in their plan. We will recognize the full measure of our creation, and nothing will give us more holy peace. I once read a wonderful analogy of the limitations our present perspective imposes on us. The message was, that in the ongoing process of creation, our creation, and the creation of all that surrounds us, our heavenly parents are preparing a lovely tapestry with exquisite colors and patterns and hues. They are doing so lovingly and carefully and masterfully. And each of us is playing a part, our part, in the creation of that magnificent eternal peace of art. But in doing so, we have to remember that it is very difficult, very difficult for us to assess our own contributions accurately. We see the rich burgundy of a neighboring thread and think, 
that's the color I want to be. And then we admire yet another's soft, restful blue or beige and think, no, those are better colors. They're much better than mine. That's what I want to be. But in all of this, we don't see our work the way God sees it, nor do we realize that others are wishing they had our color or position or texture in the tapestry, even as we are longing for theirs. Perhaps most important of all to remember is that through most of the creative period, we are confined to the limited view of the underside of the tapestry where things can seem particularly jumbled and muddled and unclear. If nothing really makes very much sense from that point of view, it is because we are still in the process and we are unfinished. But our heavenly parents have the view from the top, and one day we will know what they know, that every part of the artistic whole is equal in importance and balance and beauty. They know our purpose and potential, and they have given us the perfect chance to make the perfect contribution in this divine design. The Lord has promised us in, the, in Doctrine and Covenants 12, verse 7, that the only qualification required to be a part of this magnificent plan is to, and I quote, have desires to bring forth and establish, establish this work. Yea, whosoever will thrust in his sickle and reap, the same is called of God. Therefore, if you will ask of me, you shall receive. If you will knock, it shall be opened unto you. Sometimes in our sowing and reaping and sifting, it might seem like God says, no, or not now, or I don't think so, when what we really want for him to say, what we wish our tapestry to receive, is an affirmative yes, or certainly right now, or of course it can be yours. I want you to know, though, that in my life, when I have had disappointments, and I have, and when I have had delays, I have lived long enough to see that if I continue to knock with unshakable faith and persist in my patience, waiting upon the Lord and His calendar, I have discovered that the Lord's no's are merely preludes to an even greater yes. I have learned in the 25 years since I was your age that the very delays and denials we worry about most, the very differences from each other that trouble our self-esteem, are the differences and delays that are the very best for our happiness and our fulfillment. I've often wondered of the struggles that may have plagued the mind of Moses when the Lord asked him to leave his royal privileges and position in order to serve him in abject poverty and meagerness. Contrast his mission with the Lord's design for Joseph to stay in Egypt and to use his power and prestige for righteous purposes. Apparently, Jeremiah was never given the blessings of marriage or of children, while Jacob had the comfort and companionship of four righteous women and many children. Joshua seems to have been an incredibly confident, charismatic, take-charge kind of leader, while Moses was often reluctant, tentative, and sometimes he had to ask the Lord twice for directions. Each had a crucial but very different role to play. And furthermore, age seems to make little difference in the diversity of this tapestry. David was a mere child when he deftly dispatched Goliath, but Abraham was 80 years old when he gave us the supreme mortal example of faith and obedience. Esther had the wealth and attention of kings, giving her the opportunity to help save a nation while Ruth was a poor and an unaccepted Moabite, 
but whose royal blood ironically carried the lineage of the Son of God himself. The Lord uses us because of our unique personalities and differences rather than in spite of them. And he needs all of us with all of our blemishes and all of our weaknesses and our limitations. So what can I be? What can I be? We can be what Heavenly Father, parents designed us and intended us and help us to be. How does one fill the measure of his or her creation? By thrusting in a sickle and reaping with all our strength and by rejoicing in our uniqueness and in our difference. To be all that you can be, your only assignment is, number one, to cherish your course and savor your own distinctiveness. And number two, to shut out conflicting voices and listen to the voice within, which is God telling you who you are and what you will be. And number three, to free yourself from the love of position or profession or the approval of men by remembering that what God really wants us to be is someone's sister, someone's brother, and someone's friend. I bear you my testimony that each of you has a purpose. It is different, it is distinct, and it is divine. God loves you, and I love you. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.